Hi, J Knights. If you're listening, please follow and subscribe. It really helps to grow the podcast and for me to bring you more episodes. Hi, Jay Knights, and welcome to episode 22 of the What the Austin podcast, and welcome to this year's Villain Off. I am super excited to be doing um, Villain Off again. Last year, myself, Kaylee, and Ellis were on, and we all talked about um, John Willoughby and Mr. Wickham, and we debated who was the worst villain. So if you enjoyed this episode after listening to it, uh, I recommend you checking that one out as well. Elle couldn't join us this year as she has a family commitment, but she's doing so well and she got accepted for her PhD, which is really amazing. And um, yeah, me and Kaylee are super chuffed for her about that and she'll definitely be on the podcast next year, so don't worry. But Kaylee's here, so um, Kaylee, welcome back. Thanks as always for having me back, Izzy and uh, Ellis. If you're listening now, we miss you a lot and we're so proud of you. And so today we are going to be doing another villain off. And we thought we'd do a, a girl villain off between Caroline Bingley from Pride and Prejudice and Isabella Thorpe from Northanger Abbey. So we're going to give an overview of each of these characters, how they're important to the plot, and then talk about similarities and differences between them. And we'll decide at the end who we think is more of a villain. I am super excited to do this and to cover Isabella and Caroline. Um, both I think are great villains and you know both have scandalous behavior so yeah I'm really looking forward to that but before we get into the episode I'd love to know Kaylee do you have any like Halloween October activities that you love or any books you like to revisit this time of year oh yes I am such a fall girl I get so excited for fall I'm very basic in my fall fun activities I love pumpkin spice lattes love oversized sweaters pumpkin painting pumpkin carving and I actually like rereading Northanger Abbey this time of year because I love the gothic element to it that Jane's other books don't have how about you (laughs) No, I also love autumn. I really do. And I was saying in my my last episode to the first one of October that this year I've actually booked to go and like pick a pumpkin from like a pumpkin farm. So fun. So I'm just like so excited to do that. I don't know why, but I just think it'll be, I don't know, maybe it's just like a novelty, isn't it? Going and picking a pumpkin too. I do love carving pumpkin. I'm really bad at it though. I'm, oh my I'm gosh, so bad at carving me pumpkins. too. I'm always afraid I'm going to slice my finger off, you know, (laughs) like this is not fall fun. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I just love, you know, hot chocolates with cream and cardigans and I just love all autumn colors. So yeah, I'm always like super excited to get to this time of year. It gives me new life. Exactly. And are are you going to do the hayride to get to your pumpkin? Oh my gosh. I don't think that's thrown in, but I think I think we just turn up in our like cars and stuff. I don't I don't think so. I don't think there's like a tractor or something that we can go on. Is that like oh, <laughs> it's such a thing in the states where you'll you'll show up to the pumpkin patch, but to actually get to the pumpkin patch, you go in the back of this truck slash wagon with a bunch of hay, and you are transported, and you get a beautiful view, and then you pick what? your pumpkin. <laughs> yeah, That's mad. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I, I hope that happens. If not, I'm going to leave it as like a thing that they should upgrade to that I get to go on a wagon and sit on hay. That's mad. <laughs> well, you'll have to just visit America in the fall, right? Yeah, that would be even better. Absolutely. We could do it together. <laughs> we could go, go pick a pumpkin out each. Yeah, and record, a, record an episode while we're on the, the haystack ride. <laughs> that should go well. <laughs> <laughs> the next villain off, we're just like on the back of a tractor. It was so funny. I love it. Okay, so to kick things off, I think I'm going to start things off with Isabella Thorpe and then Kaylee's going to take over and cover Caroline Bingley. And then what we'll do is we'll bring them both together and we'll basically work out who's worse. So it's pretty much the same format as last year's Villain Off. Okay, so Isabella Thorpe from Northanger Abbey is a really complex character, actually. So she's 21 And she's said to be really beautiful. A lot of people are very interested in her, especially men. 
and she has no fortune. Her dad has died and left her mum with pretty much little to no money. So she's quite poor. And then so obviously her children kind of the byproducts of that as well so Isabella yeah doesn't have a fortune to go on so um she does desperately need to marry and marry someone with a comfortable living I would say she's in Bath with her family and so and Catherine's obviously in Bath with the Allens so they meet up and they just become fast friends one of the quotes from Northanger says the process of the friendship between Catherine and Isabella was quick as its beginnings had been warm they called each other by their Christian names were always arm in arm when they walked pinned up each other's trains for dances and were not to be divided in the set. And they also said that on rainy mornings, they would um, shut themselves up to read novels together. So um, it sounds like kind of the perfect friendship. They obviously stick together for balls. They're really close. They read together. I mean, on the surface, it sounds pretty idyllic. I would say, what do you think, Kaylee, of like the original introduction to their friendship? I completely agree I think the word surface (laughs) surface level is is so telling in the relationship between Isabella and Catherine and it it seemed I it it does seem that because Isabella is four years older they are close friends and it is this idyllic relationship but also Isabella is the one who's in the know like she's teaching Catherine how to be a member of society I would say yeah Yeah, no, I totally agree. And Isabella always comes across like she knows best in Mm -hmm. that she's got so much more experience, especially with men. She has this tendency of being like, oh, I know that sex so well. They do this and they do that. Honestly, drives me at the wall when she does that. But she's like, has this air about her as if she's she's got so much more experience. And I think Austin kind of makes a joke on that when when she first introduces Isabella. She says that there was this like age difference, but also difference in knowledge of the world but I kind of feel like it was a little bit sarcastic even though Catherine is quite naive I feel like Isabella's knowledge of the world is quite fake um which I think is a key word for Isabella so um but we'll get into that I just wanted to say I completely agree that that's sarcastic because I actually think that Catherine has really good judgments and instincts even though she doesn't have that much experience but Isabella plays into Catherine's naivety and and uh, doubting of herself and just like you said puts on all these airs that she knows so much about society and is so knowledgeable but just like you said it's very comes across very inauthentic yeah I totally agree one of my favorite scenes where Isabella is at her finest is basically Catherine's running five minutes late and Jane Austen makes a point of telling us it's only five minutes late before this scene occurs so Isabella says to Catherine, my dearest creature, what can have made you so late? I have been waiting for you at least this age. And then Catherine says, have you indeed? I'm very sorry for it. But I really thought I was in very good time. I hope you've not been waiting long. And then Isabella says, oh, these 10 ages at least. I'm sure I've been waiting here at this half hour. <laughs> and that is just not so Isabella. Like it's, she's five minutes late and she's like, oh my goodness, I've been waiting my entire life for you. What are you doing? And then I love that she's like this half hour. It's like, that's not even possible because she's like, Austin already tells us that Isabella's only been there for five minutes. And I think it's brilliant. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you picked out that quotation because it just perfectly sums her up. She's so dramatic and she's also just a professional gaslighter to Catherine. Catherine will say something. She's like, no, that's not true. This falsehood is true. And it's almost like she convinces Catherine that there's this separate reality happening. Oh my God, it's so true. And I feel like something that's super fascinating as well, it kind of falls in this gaslighting thing is Isabella goes on these long spiels about like what it is to be a good friend. And she goes on like this massive conversation about her friend, um, Miss Andrews in how all these men are always really mean to Miss Andrews because she's not the prettiest in the room. But Isabella's like, I always stand up for and I always say to you and I won't pay them any intentions unless they're really nice to my friend, Miss Andrews. And she says, men think us incapable of real friendship, you know, and I'm determined to show them the difference. But then at the end of it, she says that Miss Andrews, um, she says there is something amazingly insipid about her. And I'm just like, you <laughs> just contradicted your entire argument by just like offending her by the last minute. Oh my gosh. She's so contradictory. So hypocritical. You just never have the feeling that she's saying anything that she truly means. No, absolutely. And I think it's weird because I try and put myself in the position of like first reading Northanger Abbey and like, would I have fallen for her things and thought, oh, she's just like a nice 
friend because I feel like some of the stuff is quite subtle and it's been fun to go back and kind of pick out quotations that I think really mark signs that Isabella is false before we know for sure if that makes sense like these little things like when she's five minutes early but actually and she's like oh my gosh I've been waiting 10 hundred years um and I think another really good example of that is like Isabella's obsession with men like she's just absolutely Mm. like fixated on just any men wherever and there's like the funniest scene um when it's kind of similar I think it is around the same time as the the scene when she's late and she said well she's not really late she's five minutes late but um she says they're they're kind of chatting and Isabella's clearly not paying attention much and she says um for heaven's sake let's just move away from this end of the room do you know there are two odious men who've been staring at me which I think is the key Mm -hmm. word this Mm -hmm. half hour um and I think what's actually the funniest thing ever is one she's not been there for half hour so I don't know why she's even saying that two why does she assume they're just staring at her in three after this point she goes on to basically force her and Catherine to bump into them again when she tries to pretend like she's trying to avoid them and Catherine's literally like oh should we not wait else we're going to bump into them again and she's like oh no I won't do that that's just for their benefit to stop and and wait for them no I won't do that we need to we need to hurry and go now and I just think it's oh my gosh she just it's all this like these little things and I'm just like it makes me cringe that it feels so obvious but also oh it's just like a gross fakeness about her totally she's I think she's an egomaniac she's totally self-indulgent but she likes to pretend like she isn't like she she's going to criticize these guys but she also has has to get the attention from them yeah yeah totally agree with you and I think another really annoying point about Isabella is Catherine actually forms a really good relationship with Miss Tilney so Eleanor Tilney and she's like really lovely and like basically what a friend should be um but her and her brother John actually try and like sabotage that that friendship so much and there's like an actually awful scene I think it's the first time that Catherine starts to think Isabella's a bit dodgy in this moment because Isabella is basically trying to convince Catherine to go out with them and to cancel her plans with Miss Tilney for the second time because technically they already dragged away the first time and Miss Tilney thought that she'd like, do you remember like when she, they, they're like in the carriage and Miss Tumley walks past and she's like, oh, like you've got to uh, stop and he doesn't. That is one of the most frustrating scenes. I, I feel like pulling out my hair and it, it's so horrible. And Catherine clearly doesn't want to go and is trying to put up her boundaries. And then they're going away on the carriage and you know how much Catherine wants to see Miss Tilney. And, and then she goes right by them and you see how hurt Miss Tilney is. And it's just such a, and how, and then John Thorpe is so awful in the carriage. That whole scene is just horrible. Oh my God. Wouldn't that be the, I can't even imagine anything more cringy than I had plans with somebody. And then they see me like, can you imagine if they saw you like driving away and you (laughs) with somebody else and you pass them? That would just be, that'd be so awkward now. Like, don't even think like back then when you're in a carriage and you're like really vulnerable and open. But yeah, it's so, it's so awful because it comes across as so rude, but you also know that Catherine, it wasn't her fault at all. And she was so excited to see them. So you just feel for her in that moment. And you're like, oh, Isabella is so selfish. Literally, and I think this scene only makes it worse because they're basically trying to do the exact same thing again. Um, in Isabella's, like, it becomes so manipulative. And she says she was sure her dearest, sweetest Catherine would not now seriously refuse such a trifling request to a friend who loved her so dearly. And she tries to, like, basically love bomb her to start with. And then the narrative said Isabella then tried another method. She reproached her for having more affection for Miss Tilney, though she had only known her a little while, than for her best and oldest friend. Um, oh Catherine gosh. thought that, isn't that so bad? Like, she's <laughs> like, oh, well, the love bombing's not worked. What can I try now? I'm going to basically, like, I don't even know what that is. Guilt like, tripping. Guilt tripping. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I just think that's awful. And Catherine's, Catherine, it said, well, the narrative says that Catherine thought this reproach equally strange and unkind. But I love that Catherine picks up on that that's really dodgy. And she's starting to think like, I'm kind of seeing like toxic traits here. I don't want to, like she still loves Isabella and doesn't want to call her out that that's the case. But I think she starts to notice these things about Isabella at this point. 
Yeah. And again, that's something I really like about the character of Catherine is she does have good instincts about people. She just has to learn and evolve and learn to trust, trust in those instincts. And let's give her some credit too. It's super confusing when someone's calling you my dearest, my darling, my oldest friend, but then is treating you really horribly and not actually having your best interests at heart. And also you have to think that Catherine obviously was living quite a sheltered life. Like she had her siblings, but she was like in the countryside. Like this is the first time that she's really had to navigate like a social world. And I think, I mean, it it couldn't have been worse. Like what a worse person to meet than Isabella where she's like telling you one thing, but her actions are so different. It'd be so confusing. And I get that it takes Catherine so long to actually trust her judgment on Isabella it says Isabella appeared ungenerous and selfish regardless to everything but to her own gratification and I feel like that's Mm. quite damning but Catherine's still like kind of holding out hope that it's maybe just because James is around and she's kind of acting a little bit different and I feel like Catherine gives Isabella so many chances because she appreciates her as a friend and Isabella's honestly well she begins to spiral I think but I think this is the start of her just like showing her true colors. Absolutely. And I think too, we have to remember how insular Catherine's environment was growing up. This was probably her first friend, really. And yeah, it it is impressive that she quickly sees that something's not right with Isabella, but it makes sense that she wouldn't write her off right away. Yeah. And I think as readers at this point, you start to be like, oh my gosh, this is the Bell Girl's not good news. And then it's really bad because you find out that she's engaged to Catherine's brother and you're just like, oh gosh, they're like stuck together for eight forever now. And they're talking about like how they're sisters and everything. And Isabella's going on this massive spiel about why money doesn't matter to her. And um, the, like a moderate income would be good enough for her, <laughs> which then is also contradicted. Do you remember when it's contradicted later? Because like, the letter comes back and it's like less money than she thought. And she gets on, like, she goes like a bit, she gets like quite angry about it, but in in an Isabella kind of way where she doesn't appear angry. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I study psychology and I would say the defense mechanism that she uses the most is reaction formation. So that's when there's something you don't like about yourself that you can't accept. So you act the opposite or say the opposite. So she's like, she cares so much about money. So she's going to say, oh, I don't care at all about money. Or she doesn't like that she really likes getting a lot of attention from guys. So instead she'll say, I don't care about those guys. Those guys are awful. But then she'll actually be wanting their attention. That's the hypocrisy and the contradictions. And that's, it's a classic defense mechanism. And I I see her using it the most. Oh my gosh. That's actually so true. When you were just saying that, then I was literally just like, Isabella uncovered. This is the truth. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I think it only gets worse from this point. It's like Isabella can like no longer maintain this like false narrative that she's put forward because like her true colors just start to show. And James leaves Bath and then um, Frederick Tilney's on the scene who's, I'm guessing he's kind of like a good looking guy and he's like really flirtatious and basically does whatever the hell he wants to do. Isabella goes to this ball with Catherine, but she says to Catherine, like she can't dance because James is so far away and she'd only dance with James. But then Captain Tilney goes over to her and basically asks her to dance in Isabella goes and dances with it. And when she passes Catherine, all she does is shrugs. She's just like, and smiles like oh this is like this is fine like it's not like I just told you I wouldn't dance with anybody but your brother but now I'm dancing with you know Frederick Tilney and what's even worse about it is Catherine tries to um suggest to Henry Tilney that she's like oh Isabella won't do that because she's obviously attached to my brother she'll never dance with your brother and then to watch Isabella like walk past with Frederick Tilney I think that's so awkward and I think really embarrassing for Catherine because she's tried to defend her friend's honor and her friend's just not worth it exactly you you see her trying to give Isabella the benefit of the doubt and time and time again Isabella just lets her down yeah absolutely I think it's that I just think that's so awful I feel like she had the potential to be such a good friend as well had she been all the things that she pretended to be she would have been such a good friend but because she's just not that person it's so much worse and then she just like gaslighting me again where she 
says to Catherine that John Thorpe thinks that him and Catherine are engaged. And Catherine's like, where on earth did this come from? Like, I never gave him any intention that this was the case. And Isabella's like, so cruel back. It says that she says it laughingly. And that she's basically just like, oh, a little harmless flirtation. And then she's like saying that, you know, women encourage men and she's not going to judge Catherine for doing that to her brother. And Catherine's literally like, I didn't do that. Please don't say that I have. And please put your brother to rights because I've never encouraged him, which she hasn't. As we know, as readers, she's never encouraged John. Catherine knows who she is and what she's done, but yet she makes Catherine so uncomfortable about the situation. Do you know what I mean? It's not enough to just be like, oh, that's not the case. And then she goes, oh, I'll just set my brother to rights. I'm sorry. I, he obviously got the completely the wrong idea. It's like, oh, well, if that's not the case, that's fine. But I'm going to make you feel bad about it. Exactly. Yeah, that's one of the most prime examples of the gaslighting. And instead of having her friend's best interest, first of all, she should have been able to see that uh, Catherine liked Mr. Tilney (laughs) and didn't like her brother, but she didn't want to see that because that wasn't, that would make life harder for her. So instead she's she's flipping things around and acting like Catherine led John Thorpe on and it's just so unsupportive to her friend and yeah it's horrible and that's the thing it's so hypocritical because she's literally accusing Catherine of exactly what she's doing and because she continues to flirt with Frederick Tilney going forward even in front of Catherine and Catherine's what's really sad about it is because this is so out of the ordinary for Catherine. She even says to Henry Tilney, one woman who's in love won't flirt with another man. And she's got like such a good moral compass compared to Isabella. that She thinks that she starts to worry about Captain Tilney and she's like, oh no, I think he's falling in love with Isabella and Isabella's unconsciously encouraging him. Literally says, Isabella's attachment to James was so certain and well acknowledged as her engagement that basically she couldn't be conscious in her encouragements to Frederick Tilney because she's engaged and she's meant to be marrying James. That's how Catherine thinks about it. That's a signed deal. There's no way that she'll be going for someone else. But what amazes me is that's probably what society thought as well, because it's really dangerous to like call off an engagement at this point. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And again, you see Catherine trying to give her friend the benefit of the doubt and her friend just acting in a very selfish way. Um, And just, I know you're going to get to this, but the audacity that after her behavior in front of Catherine, that she writes a letter to Catherine and tries to, you know, get her to convince James to come back to her is just completely over the top and inappropriate and again, selfish. Oh my God, literally. And what's worse about the fact that she writes that letter is this is the first time she reaches out to Catherine once Catherine goes to Northanger. So she says like, I'm definitely going to write to you. I promise like we need to talk all the time. You need to tell me all about Northanger. Then Isabella literally doesn't write anything to her and Catherine's, Mm -hmm. she doesn't think about it too often, but she does often think like, why is Isabella not sent me a letter when she promised she would? And you would think that from your friend. If you had this close friend that you've been spending every day together, you would be thinking, why have they not written me a letter that's so weird yes it's so flaky and it's so self-serving that when she finally does it's to put Catherine in this awkward position of trying to convince her brother to take Isabella back there's no thinking about Catherine and Catherine's well-being in that and I think what's worse as well is before Isabella's letter arrives she gets the letter from her brother which basically says Isabella's made him totally miserable because she's you know, going to marry, well, he thinks that she's going to marry Frederick Tilney and she's like called off the engagement. And well, I don't know if she does, but he basically says like, I can't condone your behavior. So we can't get married anymore, which is absolutely fair guys. Um, (laughs) In at the end of his letter, he says, dearest Catherine, beware how you give your heart. And isn't that just the saddest thing? Like it's so sad that both of them fall for Isabella because they're both really kind people and she totally takes advantage of both of them and I think it's so sad in Catherine again like her brother thinks that it's because that she's going to marry Frederick and she even says to like Henry oh Isabella's going to marry your brother now in Henry's like I can't really see that being the case because you know my brother's definitely not going to marry Isabella and I think he even says no no woman has ever been good enough for Frederick to love and so he knows that his brother's just like not the type to marry and if he mm-hmm. was to marry it probably wouldn't be for love and it'd probably be for money 
but he's also so aware that this could be really difficult for Catherine that she's become aware of how kind of not very nice her friend is which I think Henry was always aware of because he he would make sarcastic comments about it not in a way to upset Catherine but in a way to try and bring her around to his way of seeing it that Isabella isn't as innocent as she thinks she is Mm -hmm. uh this (laughs) I'm just processing this whole situation is just so convoluted and and screwed up it just comes back to Isabella being very self-serving selfish not thinking about others no exactly but Henry says to Catherine in losing Isabella you lose half of yourself you feel a void in your heart which nothing else can occupy but it's really interesting because Catherine's response is I do not ought I to say the truth though I am hurt and grieved that I cannot still love her that I am never to hear from her perhaps never to see her again I do not feel so very, very afflicted as one may have thought. And I think that's so interesting. It is It makes me think, though, I'm like, is that because she started to realise that Isabella wasn't as good of her friend? Like, had this happened right at the start when they were, like, reading together and going to the balls together, would it have hurt Catherine so much more? Is it because it's been, like, this little drip effect where there's issues like when she was trying to sabotage the friendship with Miss Tilney, and then when she'd seen her flirting with Frederick in the past, is it just like, is that the saving grace that makes Catherine not too upset about it? I think it is. I like what you said with the drip effect. I think it was little things building up over time that, you know, Catherine already felt emotionally distant from her. And and in those comments back to Mr. Tilney, it sounds like she's relieved she's felt so trapped (laughs) by this relationship with Isabella. And also that's just a great moment where I love Mr. Tilney because he's just so emotionally smart and so supportive of Catherine in that moment. I know, like the way he says it is almost like it hurts him to think that Catherine's now feeling like lost without her friend. Mm -hmm. And obviously that isn't the case, which is probably a relief to him, but it's so, it's so empathetic that he would even think that in the first place and also shows that stark difference between him and the Thorpes is that he has this emotional intelligence um, which I think is so important in that moment because this is obviously like all coming to the the front of how bad all of the Thorpes are Um, so I think it's good to show the contrast there yes he's emotionally intelligent and he's and he's also shrewd and savvy in a way that I think will be beneficial to Catherine, who's still a little bit more green, even though she has good judgment and good instincts and intuition. So you just see how they would be a really good match. Yeah, I totally agree. I feel I just like prop up a couple of quotes from Isabella's letter as well, because it honestly makes me oh. cringe. Like you pretty much already <laughs> covered like what she says, but honestly makes me cringe so much. Um, the first she says, she says that um, basically she starts the, the letter where she's saying, oh, um, thank God we're going to leave this vile place tomorrow talking about Bath. We obviously know that she doesn't think it's a vile place, but she's obviously just contradicts herself all the time. Um, and then she talks about how there's basically rumors going around about her and Frederick. And she's just like, oh, I was never taken in by him. That was all, you know, lies that never happened. And then she's like, pray, send me news of your brother. I am quite unhappy about him. He seems so uncomfortable when when he went away with a cold or something. Like, oh my God. Wonder (laughs) why. She's so annoying. (laughs) I just love how she's like so shameless that she can be like, I don't know why he seems so uncomfortable when he went away. Maybe he had a cold. It's like, (gasps) what? Uh, Oh my gosh, that's the perfect word. I was like, what is the word to describe her? She's shameless. She has no sense of remorse. Oh gosh, it's horrible. <laughs> anyway. Literally. Like, yeah, I feel you have got to be slightly psychopathic to actually do some of the things that she does because it's it's borderline delusional. It's almost as if she doesn't recognize that other people around her see the reality that she can like say this stuff because Catherine knows that this isn't the case. And for her to have like the scruples to send this letter and try and flip it around again, I mean what that is like the you've got to be desperate at that point to send this letter in what I mean she could have taken an entirely different approach she could have sent a letter saying I've been so foolish um I was totally drawn in by Frederick Tilney I feel terrible about it I'd like to make amends with your brother I know that maybe we can't be together anymore but 
Um, I just want to apologize. You know, I, I was totally just swept off my feet or something. Do you know what I mean? Like just something that makes it okay, not better, but okay. Instead, this just makes it worse. (laughs) She, yeah, she just doesn't have, that would require her to take responsibility and accountability. And she just can't do that. She has to create this own reality in her head and then through speech, act like she's a certain person. And then by gaslighting everyone else who are actually living in the true reality, that's how she copes and continues living the way she does into the last she's still basically trying to turn it on other people so she says that James that he took something in my conduct to miss like that it, it's his misunderstanding yeah. that actually I'm a good person and none of this happened but then she finishes the letter literally one of the final things she talks about is that Captain Tilney liked a hat that she wore I'm just like <laughs> classic narcissistic behavior anything that's amiss is someone else's fault and then also I need to be adored I need to have the attention and she's like I don't but I don't listen to anything he says it's like if you didn't think it was relevant why put it in the letter like what exactly. stupid place <laughs> it's like so ridiculous <laughs> oh my gosh yep I need to I, I need the attention but I'm not going to identify with it So I do want to talk about Catherine's judgment, but I'm going to leave it until you've done Caroline Bingley, because I think Catherine's judgment of Isabella is basically what we all think of Isabella. So I'd love to just bring that up at that point is kind of like, you know, when we talk about both of them side by side, I think that'll be a good time to bring um, that bit in. So I'll hand over to you to do Caroline Bingley. All right. That's um oh my gosh (laughs) I need a minute because now I'm so angry at Isabella (laughs) I I need to just like (laughs) take a breath (laughs) keep I keep flashing back to that cringe moment in the carriage and how Isabella set that all up so she's one of a kind I mean I mean you you can't deny it honestly she's a bizarre character (laughs) it's so true and I need a minute to transfer my rage at her to Caroline. (laughs) Um, So uh, Caroline Bingley, our our other villain of choice, is, as we know, the sister of Jane Bennett's love interest, Charles Bingley, from Pride and Prejudice. And she moves from London to Netherfield Park with Mr. Bingley, her sister Louisa, and Louisa's drunken husband, Mr. Hurst. And then, of course, the infamous Mr. Darcy comes along. Uh, things to know about Caroline is she, you know, her rank is a gentlewoman. She's 20 years old, unmarried. She has a fortune of about 20,000 pounds. And it's clear that she's interested in Mr. Darcy, who seems at best disinterested in any and all interactions with her. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> and so you see this unrequited love situation happening. Um, and I thought that Lizzie's initial description of Caroline Bingley and her sister is pretty telling. She describes them as very fine ladies, not deficient in good humor when they were pleased, not in the power of being agreeable where they chose it, but proud and conceited. They were rather handsome, had been educated in one of the first private seminaries in town, had a fortune of 20,000 pounds, were in the habit of spending more than they ought and of associating with people of rank. Um, And yeah, what do you think of that initial description? I think like some of the things that stand out to me is obviously like the fact that they're kind of like proud and and, and a bit snobby, Um, but also, so when when they say, when you said in the quote there where it was like, um, they weren't deficient of good humor when they were pleased or they were quite good at conversation when it was agreeable to them. I feel like that just sums up like what Caroline's like. It's like, if it pleases her, or it's agreeable to her, then she be she can be quite charming. Or if the, the society that she's in, if we're a good stand in, then she can be really agreeable and pleasant. But it's like, if anything falls below the line for them, That's when I think Caroline in particular is honestly such like a snob and just not a nice person. And I think Mrs. Hurst really just eggs her on in that. Yeah, I I completely agree with you. I think it's clear that she's well-bred. She knows the right kind thing to say when she needs to, the polite thing. She definitely understands societal and social expectations, but she does she is conceited she does think she's of higher rank than other people so she she can't be bothered with mrs bennett and the younger daughters 
but she does see these good qualities in Jane. And so, you know, uh, she, despite thinking she's su superior to the family, she sees the good qualities in Jane and seeks out this friendship with her. And so um, I, I thought that it was very funny, <laughs> the conversation where they're talking about how Jane is pretty and nice. And Mr. Darcy says that she smiles too much. And I like this <laughs> quote here. <laughs> First of all, so ridiculous. Um, it says, Mrs. Hurst and her sister allowed it to be so, but they admired her and liked her and pronounced her to be a sweet girl and one whom they should not object to know, know more of. Um, and then it, it says also, Mrs. Bennett's pleasing manners grew on the goodwill of Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley. And though the mother was found to be intolerable and the younger sisters not worth speaking to, a wish of being better acquainted with them was expressed toward the two eldest. And then it says, Elizabeth still saw their superciliousness in their treatment of everyone. And so a question I have for you here is it clearly Miss Bingley is, so, even though she's really kind of rude and aloof towards everyone else she is nice to Jane and do you think that that's authentic at the beginning that she actually likes Jane I don't know and I I don't know what her motive would be if it wasn't authentic if that makes sense I don't know whether it's like well um keep your enemies closer in a sense and she thinks if this person is a threat to marry my brother I want to know everything but it doesn't seem that way it seems like maybe Obviously, they're in a new place that they've never been to before. They've moved to Neverfield. Maybe it literally is like beggars can't be choosers. Who's like the most decent person in the town that we could be friends with? And Jane just happens to be that person. Do you know what I mean? Because they would be quite lonely. Like it would just be them and Mr. Darcy as a house guest. And it would be awkward to live in a big house and just be isolated. Like they need an inn. And I feel like Jane was kind of that where it was like they could do enough to be accepted into, into that society. But they didn't have to, you know, bother too much with people they didn't want to. Yes, I both of the things you said, I, I kind of oscillate between thinking it's one or the other, maybe a combination of both. I think they they are they're probably bored and they want to make, you know, a, a, a friend and they see that of everyone there. Jane, they see her as having the best breeding and maybe would be the most fun person to be around. And also another part of me thinks maybe they see the connection between Jane and Mr. Bingley and they also want to be keeping an eye on it. Uh, so that's just one thing I wanted to think about because I think whichever interpretation you have makes Caroline more or less of a villain. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's actually such a true point. Like if it's an authentic friendship, that kind of makes her less of a villain. Whereas if it was, she did it for kind of selfish motives, that would then obviously make her more of a villain. Yeah, but like, just like it, just something that we could bring up later, though, like you could look at it. Maybe Isabella's friendship with Catherine wasn't selfish to start with. Oh, and, I, and I'm thinking, too, maybe Caroline's friendship with Jane wasn't selfish to start with, too, or wasn't calculated. Maybe she actually likes Jane or maybe she did it. Oh, my sad. gosh. OK, we can get into that debate, like what <laughs> friendships like authentic okay. or not. That sounds good. Yeah, let's definitely go back to that. Um, so anyway, so this friendship between Jane and Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst starts and Jane's invited over. And as we know, her mother sends her out in the rain and she gets very sick. And so we get to know Miss Bingley a lot better while Jane is sick at the house and Lizzie comes and cares for Jane. And so we see very much that Miss Bingley is besotted by Mr. Darcy and she constantly agrees with everything that he says, despite the fact that clear an example of this is she clearly doesn't like to read, but because Mr. Darcy's reading, she says these ridiculous quotes like I declare after all there's no enjoyment like reading how much sooner one tires of anything than a book when I have a house of my own I shall be miserable if I have not an excellent library but then it, it shows that she's not even looking at the book and is bored looking at Mr. Darcy's book so she's constantly clearly being inauthentic to her own interests and doing everything she can to impress Mr. Darcy, which I find super desperate and cringe. What do you think about that? 
it makes me cringe so much and I feel like the adaptations do such a good job with that scene because they'll be like sat there and she's like obviously not reading the book and then she just like she says that quote and then she just like shuts it up really quickly and it's just like well clearly (laughs) that was all just for show because and then she's like I'd I'd rather walk around the room let's take a turn about the room instead (laughs) oh my gosh yes that was the scene I was about to bring up first of all I think it's cringe when Mr. Darcy just doesn't respond to anything she (laughs) says or and yeah exactly I think exactly that infamous scene where she's trying to get Mr. Darcy's attention and he won't look at her and she knows that if she (laughs) engages Elizabeth in some activity that Mr. Darcy will give her attention so that scene yeah where she says let's take a turn about the room and she's showing off her body to Mr. Darcy And even though she knows on some level that he's looking at Elizabeth and interested because of Elizabeth, she's fine with using Elizabeth to get any kind of attention from him, which I just find so desperate. Uh, Yeah, I'm going to say for dating advice, I really don't think a good (laughs) idea is to find someone that that whoever you're interested in likes more and then just taking them about everywhere. I don't think that's going to work out for you. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) yeah it's such a weird approach like I can't imagine why why you'd possibly do that unless at this point she's not fully aware of how much Mr Darcy does like Elizabeth and so she's thinking oh if I put us side by side maybe he'll see that I've got a better form or something I don't know I never thought of it that way but that that could that could definitely be true because I think at this point the only interaction that's happened is uh, she found out from Mr. Darcy that he admired Elizabeth's fine eyes. And I, I think that's the only thing that's been said. And she, at this point, she's teasing Mr. Darcy relentlessly about that. Um, yeah. And she's been talking about like what it is to the perfect woman in a sense. And I feel like one of her comments is about the air that you have when you're like walking around. So maybe she's trying to show <laughs> that she has better air than Elizabeth. Oh, that's so true. She, yes, she's going to put herself side by side with Elizabeth and, and, and show him how she's the ideal woman. And you're right. That's such a cringe speech that she gives when she's talking about the ideal woman. And it totally backfires because Mr. Darcy then compliments Elizabeth, right? Like he, he says, an ideal woman improves her mind by extensive reading. And Elizabeth is holding a book at that point. I oh my god scene. maybe another conspiracy <laughs> maybe caroline's like well i don't really like reading but he's obviously interested in the fact that elizabeth does maybe if i can get her to walk with me that'll stop her from reading and you know <gasps> then we're on the oh same le- page again yeah we're both the same level again oh my gosh so it, it just like isabella it shows up differently but there's a lot of um falseness and manipulation happening and i think one thing that can definitely be said of, of Caroline is in, in addition to putting Lizzie in this weird position where she herself is trying to impress Mr. Darcy, when she finds out Mr. Darcy likes Lizzie, she bad mouths Lizzie constantly. She'll say, unlike Isabella, she'll say rude things to Lizzie's face, but then also as soon as she leaves the room, just is relentless about criti- being very critical of her. And an example of this is she talks to Mr. Darcy when Lizzie's out of the room and he says, and she says, you will have a charming mother-in-law indeed. And of course she will always be at Pemberley with you. She's constantly talking about how Lizzie's family's inferior, even bringing in uh, uh, Lizzie's extended family, like Mrs. Phillips and the gardeners and, and laughs really unkindly about them being in Cheapside. And what's actually super hypocritical about this that I hadn't realized before is that the way that she has her own 20,000 pounds is from trade, but she's laughing at them because they're in trade. So she's very condescending in that way, but it's hypocritical because that's how she got her family money. It's really interesting. So I had this conversation on another episode with Charlie. I think it was my Who Wants to Be a Millionaire episode. But we had the conversation about um, the fact that the Bingleys are from trade. And what we thought was because they're from trade, maybe they're not established enough in like genteel society because they're only like, I think it was like her dad 
was kind of the start of the genteel society for their family and then it's them and obviously yes they do have money but it's so much more than that in in kind of this upper class society it's where are your root and I feel like their roots weren't strong enough so I think this is why she's so fixated on Mr Darcy because should she marry Mr Darcy that fully establishes her as somebody part of like genteel society part of upper class society whereas I feel like they're still on the borders like in somewhere like um Meryton it wouldn't matter so much because it's just a rich family that come to town and people don't look into things as much but I feel like in London she's maybe um a small fish yes and that would make sense as to why she's overcompensating so much and being so snobby and conceited she's not truly confident in her own place in society so she's gonna project these insecurities onto other people that she knows are of inferior rank that's so interesting oh my gosh so I guess there's a lot of this tension between Lizzie and Caroline and Mr. Darcy and I guess the next important thing to talk about is we have the infamous Netherfield ball shortly after this and you know she and Mr. Darcy realize how strong Jane and Mr. Bingley's attachment is. And so her infamous letter that seems to come out of the blue where she doesn't even, she's supposed to be friends with Jane. She doesn't even say goodbye to Jane. And then she sends this letter insinuating that not only Mr. Bingley is leaving out of the blue and not to return, but that she hopes that Mr. Bingley is, is gonna marry Georgiana. And I, if I could describe this letter in one word, I would just say so cruel, cruel and jarring. And I would love to hear your reaction to this letter. I think what I'm like interested in is who was the mastermind behind this? Was it Darcy and did he lead the way? And Caroline thought, oh, this is a way for me to get on his good side is that I support this like plan of his. Or was it Caroline? I See, I, I, I favor that it was Mr. Darcy because I think, Caroline's tried all of these motives with Mr. Darcy, like saying like, oh, these people are poor and we don't need anything to do with them and it's not worked. But I feel like if it came from Mr. Darcy, that's why things would actually take place and Charles would leave and everything. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it would have to be Mr. Darcy to make this choice in Caroline's cruel behavior. Her, the only motive I can see strong enough is that it helps her get Mr. Darcy. Oh yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think Mr. Darcy was the initiator of that. And as we know, anything that Mr. Darcy does, she's going to go above and beyond and overboard to agree with him and go along with what he wants. And I think in addition to going along with what he wants, she wants him, but she also has the motive to get him away from Lizzie. So if they all go back, then she's not going to be worried about Mr. Darcy and Lizzie's attraction escalating. Because remember, Mr. Darcy asked Lizzie to dance at the Netherfield Ball. And that was a big deal because he only stood up with Caroline and Mrs. Hurst. So Caroline had to have witnessed that and been like, whoa, I'm in danger of losing him. I need I need to get Darcy away from Lizzie. Yeah, I can imagine it made her feel so good, though, that Mr. Darcy was like, we need to get bingley away from jane because she's not suitable like that was probably like eased her mind a little bit she was like well if she he doesn't think that jane's suitable for his friend then he's not going to think lizzie's suitable for him but what amazes me is that doesn't stop caroline's like torment do you know what i mean like as the book continues she's still she's still willing to like make the family like the bennett's look um kind of a little bit ridiculous um, I, you might bring this up anyway, but I would like the point where she makes about the fact that the family are kind of obsessed with the the militia. And she's like, oh, the red coat's leaving for you. That That is a big loss for your family. Yes, she does these 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 digs. I, I actually wasn't going to bring up that part, but that is an important part where she just she'll she'll try to embarrass Lizzie in front of everyone and belittle her publicly. And I would say. Well, we'll get to the comparison between um, Caroline and Isabella, but I would say that there's less of that overt public humiliation with Isabella that Caroline tends to do. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to make sure we highlighted some of the parts of this letter, which is also just very 
cringe. I do not pretend to regret anything I shall leave in Hertfordshire except your society, my dearest friend. But I hope we will at some future period enjoy many returns of the delightful intercourse we have known. And in the meanwhile, may lessen the pain of separation by a very frequent and most unreserved correspondence. I depend on you for that. Like acting like she's gonna miss Jane so much, but then how, how she actually responds is blowing Jane off when Jane comes to visit London is rude to her, waits three weeks to visit her and only does it because of propriety. And then acts like there's no way that Jane could see Mr. Bingley and hides from Mr. Bingley that Jane's in town. Just the fact that she would act like she misses Jane so much, but then behave in such a cruel manner is, it just doesn't sit very well. Again, I feel like that we'll, we'll get into the comparisons, but it's that shamelessness again. It's like doing something that you think that you just like you you don't care the impact that it'll have well I think it is like so sad that when Jane goes to stay that she doesn't even go and visit and and when she does I think Jane even makes the comment where she's like I could tell that there was anywhere else she'd rather be exactly I think that that is the the telling moment where Jane realizes okay <laughs> Miss Bingley does not have my best interests at heart and doesn't really want to be my friend and I think, I think you're right with this shamelessness. Clearly, Caroline called Jane a friend and said all of these nice things to her. And clearly, Caroline knew that Jane and Bingley had a strong connection. And, and despite that, she says this. When my brother left us yesterday, he imagined that the business which took him to London might be concluded in three or four days. But as we are certain it cannot be so, and at the same time convinced that when Charles gets to town, he will be in no hurry to leave it again, we have determined on following him thither that he may not be obliged to spend his vacant hours in comfortless hotel. And then she says, Mr. Darcy is impatient to see his sister and to confess the truth, we are scarcely less eager to meet her again. I really do not think Georgiana Darcy has her equal for beauty, elegance, and accomplishments. Oh my gosh, what a dig at Jane and how horrible. And the affection she inspires in Louisa and myself is heightened into something still more interesting from the hope we dare to entertain of her being here after our sister. I don't know whether I ever before mentioned to you my feelings on the subject, but I will not leave the country without confiding them. And I trust you will not esteem them unreasonable. My brother admires her greatly already. He will have frequent opportunity of now seeing her on the most intimate footing. Her relations all wish connection as much as his own. And a sister's partiality is not misleading me, I think, when I call Charles most capable of engaging any young woman's heart. Oh my gosh, what a dig. With all these circumstances to favor an attachment and nothing to prevent it. Am I wrong, my dearest Jane, in indulging the hope of an event which will secure the happiness of so many? Oh my God, don't. Ugh. It's so manipulative and it's such a dig at Jane. And it's, she has to know how, devastated Jane is going to be reading that and also it makes Jane like question her whole reality like the way that Caroline writes this is as if Mr Bingley's like a Frederick Tilney that he's just flirting with people for the fun of it and Jane's just being caught up in this but I love that she's like I don't know if I've mentioned this before but this is my view on the on, on all of this scenario it's like you, you know why you haven't mentioned it Caroline because you wouldn't have the scruples to do it to Jane's face because you know it would be really yes. upsetting to her and you'd look like an absolute div yes oh my gosh that, that's exactly right and of course she didn't mention it before because Jane and Bingley were attached at the hip and clearly flirting but of course you're right once she's removed from the situation she in writing can also like Isabella create this alternative reality where she pretends like she never saw that Jane and Bingley had a had an attachment What's sad about it though is Jane thinks that she says like she's trying to put me on my guard like so that I'm not vulnerable to to Charles and I think she does um Charles such a disservice in this letter because she makes him appear like just not a decent guy and I think it's so sad yeah. because he's actually one of the nicest male characters that Austin writes I think and yeah just pulls him into all the lies and the deceit. 
That's true. She, she paints him in a pretty unflattering light. And I will say one part of Pride and Prejudice that is difficult to deal with is how much people think that they can manipulate Mr. Bingley when he is such a nice guy and his intentions with Jane are so pure. So, yeah. Um, And so, again, we mentioned this already, but Jane goes to London and Miss Bingley's treatment of her solidifies, even in Jane's mind, that this, this woman doesn't have her best interest at heart. I would say from there, it's uh, what's important is that when Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy are reconnecting when she visits Pemberley, Caroline Bingley really realizes that Mr. Darcy seriously cares about Elizabeth and she's super rude. She talks about her appearance, how her appearance has altered so much. She brings up how the the loss of the militia must be so devastating for Lizzie's family. And then we have this very satisfying moment where Mr. Darcy finally stands up for Elizabeth and says, she is one of the most handsome women of my acquaintance and really puts Caroline in her place. I just love that so much because I also think this is like a moment where Mr. Darcy's like recognizing like all the mistakes he's made because I think he probably realizes that he's played into what Caroline does where she puts people down and she lets pride take over and and like snobbish behavior in everything that he's done since leaving well upon leaving Neverfield has been in support of her thought process and I think in this moment it like completely flips that and he just starts taking an entirely different approach to life and he's like oh my gosh I need to not be you know being such a div I need to be you know kind I'm never gonna win Elizabeth and I think this takes Caroline by like such a surprise and I love that And I think she needs this because you just can't go through life being so nasty about people. Like it's just, it's wrong. Exactly. I think, I think he's finally, before he just kind of sat back and even indulged her a little bit when she would talk about Elizabeth and Elizabeth's family. And I think this is the moment where he sets the boundary. And I think she understands that she can't really behave in the same way of talking badly about Elizabeth and kind of from then on, The next time we really see Caroline in the book is when Jane and Bingley get engaged. She sends a letter to Jane with her best wishes. And we, Jane has this moment of not being deceived anymore that Caroline has her best interest. And um, then when she finds out that Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth are engaged, she is absolutely mortified. She feels all this shame, but she realizes she wants to be able to visit Pemberley. So she realizes she has to put this jealousy aside, at least externally. And so it says how she retains her original deferential attitude toward Darcy and Georgiana and takes care to treat Elizabeth with all politeness and respect. So it's, I don't know what you make of this, but it, it kind of sounds like she learns to change her tune and maybe moving forward while she's not going to be super effusive towards Elizabeth she's not going to treat her the way she did in the past I think because she can't marry Darcy she doesn't want to be like excluded from the Darcy's if that makes sense because they're such an established family in society having them as a connection I think at that point it's still is going to be super important um especially now because she's Darcy's not an option for her she's got to find somebody else and I'm sure they won't be too interested if she's like somebody who's hated by a well-established family Yes, I completely agree with that. And I think on just some authentic level, one of the things I will say for Caroline is I think she truly authentically had feelings for Darcy. And again, it's this desperation thing where it's okay, if I can't marry him, I still want to be around him as much as possible. And so she knows that this is the way that she can still see him and and be around the family, even if she can't be with him. You know what's really interesting in that is you might be doing her like a, you might be giving her a greater compliment of her actions than she actually deserves. Like it could absolutely be the case that it's because she loves Mr. Darcy, but in like contrast, could it be that she, um, it was that thing about the fact that she's in trade and she's trying to basically social climb still. Yeah, I think it totally depends on um, your interpretation. I think both are 
valid. I don't know what it is where there is something that that can make me feel bad for her because I think she's she acts so desperately because she really cares for Mr. Darcy. But I've never I've never thought to look at it that other way that it might be more calculated than that. Yeah, I guess it's difficult as well because she puts all of her eggs in one basket. Like Mr. Darcy is the only person that we see her trying to go for and she just really does anything in her power to try and make sure that's the case. And also we don't see them prior to coming to Neverfield. So prior to meeting the Bennets. And for all we know, Mr. Darcy could have been like dead nice to her and could have given her some attention prior to that point. I don't know, like it's possible. Um, I doubt it. I feel like he's so over her. I don't know. Who knows though? Yeah. It's true. I, uh, it's so yeah. funny. Oh, she makes me cringe though with how desperately she tries to get his attention the in the lengths that she'll go to oh it's bad it's it's embarrassing really isn't it yes actually I'm looking at this quotation from her that I wrote down Jane Austen is brilliant she it's when they're talking about the accomplished woman and it says oh certainly cried his faithful assistant that's no. so telling, right? <laughs> no one can really be esteemed accomplished who does not so greatly surpass what is usually met with. A woman must have thorough knowledge of music, singing, drawing, dancing, and the modern languages to deserve the world. And besides all this, she must possess a certain something in her air and manner of walking. D- dig at Elizabeth. <laughs> the tone of her voice, her address and expressions or the word will have be deserved. I just, I just love that Jane calls Caroline his faithful assistant. Like she will do anything to get him. She will say anything to please him. It, it is just like you said, so desperate. Most of the time she has to go after her family. And I think it's because she recognizes there isn't much to criticize Elizabeth for. That's so true. You're right. It, 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 most of the digs are about her family and I'm trying to think, I guess when she says that she got tanner and her appearance is altered. Yeah, she has to go after her appearance <laughs> because Elizabeth She's is seen pretty- too much sun. <laughs> <laughs> so ridiculous. And it's true because Elizabeth does know how to behave in society. Yeah, so true. Okay, do you want, are you, have you covered everything you wanted to cover on terms of Caroline on her own? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Okay, I'm excited then. Let's look at like some, I don't know, cross comparison then. So do you want to go back to the friendship point that we were saying, like, are the friendships authentic or are they false and for selfish motives? Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. I, okay, my personal opinion is, I think Isabella is a narcissist and I don't think any part of her friendship with Catherine is ever authentic. I think she likes the fact that she's four years older than Catherine and can appear much more knowledgeable and in the know. And I think she likes to think that she's prettier than Catherine. Catherine's her little minion and Elizabeth, um, sorry, (laughs) and Isabella gets to be the one who kind of soaks up all of the attention. And whereas I actually do think that Caroline Bingley did see value in in qual, qual in Jane's qualities, and I think that Caroline Bingley initially was interested in getting to better know Jane, but then it was too threatening when Jane was with her brother, and she wanted to go along with what Mister Darcy wanted, and so I don't know what you think about that, but long story short, is I think Caroline actually did like Jane at the beginning, whereas I think. Isabella was always calculated in her friendship with Catherine yeah I think I feel the same I think Isabella's friendship with Catherine was all to do with James her brother because she hadn't actually got engaged to him yet so I think she thought I know he's really close with his family what a perfect opportunity his sister's right here if I can get in with her then one it might encourage him to come to Bath but two you know, he's going to think more of me because I'm friends with his sister. And so I've already got that link there and he'll think, oh, she'll fit in with my family so well. So I agree. I think it was all calculated. I don't think Isabella does anything that isn't, I don't think she, I think everything that she does in life is a calculated move. Even that with the men when she sees them and she purposely makes the route so that they'll bump into them again. And um, 
just everything that she does she does it purposefully for a reason for whatever her current desire is but I agree I think that Caroline Bingley on the other hand needed a friend in the area because it was a new area and they, she only had a sister and obviously her sister's married so it's in a different position so I think she needed another single woman to be friends with to kind of occupy her time yeah okay so we, we're definitely on the same page with that um another so when I when I think about similarities and differences another thing that I want to talk about is who you think is more mean-spirited and Ooh. yeah Okay, let me hear your thoughts on it. So I actually would say that I think Caroline is more mean-spirited, whereas I think Isabella is just more narcissistic. She's more focused on herself. She's never to Catherine's face saying anything openly mean to her. She's more manipulative than mean-spirited, whereas I think... Um, Caroline is very mean spirited and how she jokes to Mr. Darcy about insulting Lizzie's family and talks about the Bennett's low connections. Um, I thought it was really mean spirited that she saw Jane in London and was cold to her and then said she'd visit her and then waits three weeks and is completely rude and, and acts like Mr. Bingley's forgotten about Jane. Um, I also think that letter that she writes to Jane is just incredibly, incredibly mean spirited. And I think, I think Caroline says things that are more rude to people's faces, whereas Isabella is more passive aggressive. Okay, I'm going to put a, a, a thing out there. Do you think the person that she's doing it to makes the biggest difference, if that makes sense? So like if Catherine was dealing with Caroline, Caroline was being openly like cruel to her and everything. Do you think that would be as dangerous as what Isabella does to Catherine? Ooh, I think, I think what Isabella does to Catherine is actually more dangerous because of the gaslighting, the, the like presupposition of, oh, I, I, my dear Catherine, I care about you so much. And the fact that it's more underhanded versus Caroline, it, it depends on which situation we're talking about, but attacks Lizzie and through the letter attacks Jane. Um, whereas I think Isabella is not really trying to attack Catherine. She's just trying to um, use Catherine for her own, for her own motives and her own means. It still hurts, Catherine but it's more of a narcissistic impulse versus a calculated I want to hurt this person impulse yeah I agree so it's not like she's actually threatening Catherine's happiness and Catherine's life and a lot of the things that she does it's all just mind games whereas what Caroline does is actually affecting Jane's life and her love life and who she can end up with and also could affect their standing in society because she's constantly trying to knock them down and she's preventing potentially another match of Darcy and Elizabeth by trying to turn him against her. So I, I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think what Caroline does because it's so open is more of a threat than what Isabella does because basically when Catherine says no to Isabella, then that's kind of the end of the story. There's not much Isabella can do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, I think when it comes down to it, Isabella is a bad friend because she doesn't think and she doesn't think through enough what Catherine's needs are or what Catherine, the kind of support that Catherine would need in the situation. Whereas Caroline, I think, is very focused on let me see how I can make a dig to make this person feel bad. I think Isabella is just more out of it and self-involved. OK, so in terms of like who will be the worst villain, and so something I'd say for Isabella is She's obviously in a really different situation to Caroline, isn't she? Because she has no fortune. And mm -hmm. so you can almost see her kind of more like a Jane Fairfax or a, um, a Charlotte Lucas. But I would say the biggest difference between those characters and Isabella is they're willing to, to um, look at things from a stance of like self-preservation and they'll be like, I want a comfortable living or... Um, Jane Fairfax is willing to become a governess whereas Isabella is like seriously like money hungry like she 
as soon as she gets a better offer than James, she's willing to go for that. But you have to remember as well, she thinks James is a good match, better than what he actually is, because they've got this misunderstanding that the Allens are going to be like supporting them or like giving them extra money or that their family's more wealthy. So I think she's absolutely so focused on like self-promotion. And I think that makes her like a dangerous fortune hunter, more like a Lucy Steele than um, somebody who's basically just trying to protect their basically someone who's trying to you know just make sure that they're in a comfortable living which a lot of women were like if you had no money you had to marry and you had to marry somebody who at least was going to give you a comfortable living and I don't think that's a crime but I think it becomes a crime when your sole drive is money yeah oh comparing her to Lucy Steele that's an, a really really excellent comparison I think they both have that money hungry manipulative streak absolutely um and i think this is a really good point about when we compare caroline and isabella thinking about their financial situation one argument to have that we should give isabella a little bit more leeway is because she was the eldest of all of these daughters there's this very telling scene at the beginning where the mom you can tell the mom puts pressure on Isabella to be the hope for the family because Isabella is the most confident and attractive one. So she must have internalized the fact that, okay, we don't have a fortune and I am my, the hope for my family. So there's a little bit more leeway in her with this desperation to find a good match than there is for Caroline who is financially secure and she still (laughs) behaves so terribly. So I think Isabella is truly terrible and very dangerous and narcissistic, but that's the one area where I I do have a little bit of compassion for her situation. This is actually making it hard for me now because I'm actually thinking, is that enough to make her less of a villain because she actually has a reason to like support her family and stuff and to actually make a good match. I'm just like, But then I also think you don't have to be an absolute crazy narcissist. Like Jane is in the exact (laughs) same position. She's the eldest daughter. She's pressurized by her mom to make a good match. And yet Jane's like a lovely person. Like you don't have to turn into a psychopath just because you, you know, have pressure from your family to have a good match. Oh, yeah. I I mean, I think Isabella is, is truly terrible. No matter what your financially financial situation is, there's no excuse for the way that she gaslights Catherine and is, is flaky and false. She is awful <laughs> in that way. And actually, one way that I would say that Caroline is less of a vil- villain is she's less fake than Isabella. Even though she's kind of cruel and, and mean-spirited, She pretends to be friends with Jane, but she never is over the top with it. Whereas Isabella goes, my dearest, darling, greatest friend of all time. All of that language as if they've been lifelong friends since they were five. Isabella takes it to this false level. Whereas Caroline viewed Jane as a friend, but it wasn't that over the top false scenario. If that makes sense. Such a good point. It's like Caroline owns the fact that she's a bit of a a, a bee. But I don't know. <laughs> Do you know yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like she owns the fact that she is that. Whereas Isabella just lives in her own delusion and she just is actually crazy. I'm not going to lie to you. She's crazy. Um, So yeah. I agree. I think there's something to be said about if you can actually own who you are as a person and go out there because people know what they're getting from you then. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that makes you as dangerous. Whereas Isabella pretends to be somebody entirely different in, I don't even think it's that she can no longer uphold the facade anymore. It's more that she doesn't care. Charlotte, like, cause Catherine's no longer the focus. So she's just like, well, I've not got time to focus on my facade with you because I need to focus on somebody else now. And then she goes back to it and she has to pick up the pieces, but she just gets lost in all of her lies. It's, it's awful. Honestly, so if you okay, I've got a question for you. In real life, who would who if you had to deal with one of them, who would you prefer to deal with? Oh, I would definitely prefer to deal with Caroline Bingley. Yeah. I, I I think I would feel less threatened because on some level I would know what I was getting from her. Like she's never nice to Elizabeth, you know. Lizzie never thinks that, oh, Caroline likes me. 
And I don't have very much sympathy for Isabella, but I do feel sorry for Caroline at times because I think she's just so desperate for Mr. Darcy's affection that that that's why I don't know. I can have a little bit more compassion for her situation and I have less compassion for Isabella's behavior. What about you? Yeah. God, it's really hard though, isn't it? When you think about it, I think, yeah, definitely. I feel like Caroline would be easier to deal with. I also think the thing with Caroline is that she's not as much of a leech. And so you would know yeah. there would be a point where you could kind of just like get away from her. Like you could leave and not be around her. Whereas Isabella, you can't shake her off. If you're her target, that's it. She's just like on you all the time. You can't escape her. And she's constantly filling your head full of just rubbish. And so mm. I just think if should you forever be a target, that would be an absolute hellish life. So I think definitely Caroline, because at least you could escape Caroline and, you know, you could escape not too harmed if you, you know, as long as you weren't after a brother, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I feel like even if it's even if it's not a pleasant truth, I always feel more secure being around someone if I'm getting some element of honesty. And so even if Caroline didn't like me, I'd, I'd go, OK, I know what I'm getting. Whereas with Isabella, I would just feel so uncertain about everything all the time because she's so false. Um, and I also think one other thing I wanted to say about Caroline is she does have these moments where she has these acts of caring. And I don't know if it's pressure to be proprietress or if it comes from a genuine place. But even though she's condescending, she does invite Lizzie to stay so that Lizzie can be with her sister while Jane's sick. And then when she finds out Jane's worse, Mr. Bingley's going to send for the country doctor. And Miss Bingley insists on sending for one of the out of town physicians or one of the town physicians so that she gets the best care. And on the one hand, I'm like, okay, this might be you being snobby and, and doing a power trip of I, I know what's best. But on the other hand, I'm like, you don't have to go above and beyond for someone you don't care about. So maybe on some level, she did care for Jane and wanted to do the right thing by her health. Yeah, she could have literally just sent her back or she could have been like, you know, your sister can't come and stay. Yeah, I think that's a great point, actually. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I don't think Isabella would would do that. <laughs> yeah, Isabella would be too... Isabella can't involved. even write you a letter. Isabel can't, <laughs> Isabella can't write you a letter if you're away for like a few weeks. So no, she's not going to get you a fancy doctor, is she? <laughs> yeah, like Isabella is not going to reach out or, or engage with you unless she feels like she can get something out of it. And Caroline didn't have anything financially or practically to get out of the relationship with, with Jane, but she still sought out that friendship. So, so true. Yeah. I feel like Isabella would like blame you for like ruining her time because you were sick. Oh, she'd totally. Like, she, she'd be like, I can't believe you've done this to me because I wanted to go to the ball. And, well, she'd do it in a way that's actually gaslighting and not being like overt about it. She'd be like, oh, I'm so disappointed that I can't go to the ball, but I guess I can stay all night with you, my dearest friend, even though it makes me, it pain, it, you know, it hurts me that I can't go to the ball, but. I love you enough that I'll stay with you to the extent that you just be like, please go to the ball because I don't want to see you miserable. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Wow. That was, that was amazing. (laughs) First of all, that's exactly how she would be. Actually, she'd pretend like she'd stay with you and then she'd still go to the ball. Yeah. Yeah. She'd be like, oh, I can see somebody shouting me from the window. Oh gosh. I, I must go to them. It'd be so rude if I don't. And then you'd just be there like sick on your own and just like... (laughs) (laughs) You die on Isabella's watch. At least Caroline gets you the best doctor. Exactly. Caroline, even if she doesn't want to do the right thing, she might do the right thing. Whereas I think we know that Isabella would always do the wrong thing if what the right if the right thing wasn't serving her. I totally agree. Um, so I think this is like a really good time to talk about Catherine's judgment because I don't think it's far off what we've been saying about Isabella. So Catherine states, well, the narrative and Catherine states, Such a strain of shallow artifice could not impose even upon Catherine. Its inconsistencies, contradictions and falsehoods struck her from the very first. She was ashamed of Isabella and ashamed of having ever loved her. And then she goes on to say, um, 
obviously in shock that Isabella would say to write to James on her behalf in the narrative states, no, James should never hear Isabella's name mentioned by her again. She must think me an idiot or she could not have written me so. I do not believe she ever had any regard either for James or for me and I wish I had never known her. I do not think Isabella has any heart to lose. I think Catherine's judgment isn't far off our own. So are we coming to the conclusion that Isabella (laughs) is the worst villain? Yes, I think Isabella is way worse than Caroline. Okay, Isabella, the villain off winner of 2022. (laughs) (laughs) And I think the only time that Caroline ever comes close to the level of cruelty is in the letter to Jane. And I think we should know that's probably the closest she ever comes to getting to getting Darcy as well. So that's the closest she ever gets to the prize. So maybe that's why it's kind of the worst of her cruelty. Oof. Yeah. Well, congratulations, Isabella. You are the worst and you win the villain off. <laughs> so if people want to find you, where should they go? Um, you can Here, find me on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm in Chicago, Illinois now. Um, I, my Instagram handle is half underscore agony underscore half underscore hope. And yeah, I just post a lot of quotes from literature and psychology that I love. And most of the literature quotes are Jane Austen quotes. So absolutely, come find me. And you'll find Kaylee on the podcast lots. So she's on loads of episodes. So, you know, make sure you (laughs) check those other ones out because we always have so much fun. And also definitely check out last year's Villain Off. We did Willoughby and Wickham, like I said at the start. And that was such a fun episode as well. And obviously Alice was on with us then as well, which was cool because I got to play kind of a, I wasn't on either side. And it was like you guys convincing me. So it was kind of a different style, wasn't it? (laughs) Yeah, you were more of the mediator. That was a really, really fun setup too. And um, yeah, I hope Ellis will be able to come back and do another one with us. That would be super fun. Also, we'd love to, you should DM us and give us thoughts on who we should do for the next villain off. We'd love to hear your input. Oh my gosh, such a point. Yeah, absolutely. Get those thoughts in. And also I will say, if you have any thoughts on any of the episodes that have happened this year, uh, me and Kaylee are going to be doing like a reflections episode um, to wrap up this year. So that's going to be really fun. And I'm definitely going to share it on my Instagram as well. Um, So at what the Austin and I'll be putting some requests in to see what people thought of the episode, what your favorite episodes. Um, Because yeah, we're going to be looking back, looking back on the year What's the year been like on the podcast? (laughs) Oh my gosh, I cannot wait for that. There's so much to discuss. So much has happened. (laughs) 